Hello, everyone. Today on the Arthritis Foundation Oaks blog, I have the distinct pleasure of being here with Dr. Francis Berenbaum, who is a world expert in phenotyping for osteoarthritis and new cutting edge opportunities for therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Berenbaum is the uh, or he is the, a professor in the Department of Rheumatology at the Sorbonne in Paris, which I would much rather be in Paris interviewing him face to face today, but hopefully soon in the future. Um, he also is in the Department of Rheumatology at St. Antoine Hospital, and he leads a team of researchers focused on OA at INSERM. And so um, he's contributed so many wonderful position pieces and opinion pieces, as well as original data uh, on the idea of looking at different cohorts within the greater osteoarthritis patient subgroup. And so um, this will be a lot of fun to talk about opportunities. Um, so as far, the thing that I have really um, enjoyed the most about your work, uh, Dr. Berenbaum, is that you are a rheumatologist by training and you come from this background of looking at systemic uh, indicators in osteoarthritis. So I'm really curious how you got focused on osteoarthritis within all the opportunities in rheumatology. Um, yes, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, in fact, I think that... Um, this is based on my uh, consultation a very long time ago. And, um, you know, I, I'm in the generation of, of the methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and then in, in the 2000, the uh, uh, biotherapies with anti-TNF and so on. So new answers for patients. But for osteoarthritis, the unmet need was so high and is still so high that I considered that it would be fantastic for the patients to find uh, a new target to increase our knowledge in the disease. And so this was really the, the, the reason uh, why I, I wanted to focus on OA. You, you, you have to know that when I started working on OA, um, OA was not considered as a disease. It was fatality. It was because you are aging and so uh, you are an elder line. So it's, it's normal to be uh, in your armchair with your pain, uh, not uh, uh, with no possibility for walking. Uh, this is normal. Uh, it's, it's the fatality with age. And so I, 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 I didn't accept that. And, and, and I really thought that we really need to increase our knowledge for the patients. Well, I really appreciate that because I was speaking in a previous blog episode about, uh, obviously, I not necessarily have a personal connection yet with OA, but uh, I watched the biologics really change my mother's life. She has psoriatic arthritis and biologics really came at a critical time where um, there was some hopelessness feeling with her own experience with methotrexate. And so um, I have this lofty goal of, and, and I think you have similar ideas too about um biologics for OA. And I, th I think it's possible. And I'm excited about that and hopeful that there can be a huge revolution fact, in that space. Yeah. In, in fact, I know that there are, there are still patients with rheumatoid arthritis or, or ankylosing spondylitis or, or psoriatic arthritis uh, who, who are not responding to the uh, treatments. But I would say altogether, the, the majority of the patients now are, are, are well treated with the drugs we have today for these diseases, but not for OA. But looking in the biologic space for OA is also fraught with disappointment recently. I really enjoyed your own contribution on tenezabab or the uh, anti-NGF. Uh, and I'm, I'm really curious to hear your insights on that and, and what that experience was like to be involved in a study that was evaluating it and then ultimately see that the FDA uh, rejected it as a possible yeah. treatment. Yes. Yeah, so, of course, it was very uh, disappointing because... Uh, having a, a, a new solution, another solution uh, for pain uh, uh, and symptoms of osteoarthritis would be uh, 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 very important and critical for our patients. Um, uh, we, we, we knew that the um, uh, uh, effect of, of this family of drugs, which are the anti-NGF and uh, antibodies raised again nerve growth factor, mm -hmm. uh, um, that the, 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 the efficacy uh, uh, was uh, uh, important with this family of drug. And we also knew before the FDA meeting that uh, there was some uh, 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 adverse events and this uh, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis problem. Uh, the, 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 the question is more 
how to pick up these patients that will have this kind of, of problem before introducing the drug. So in order to eliminate these patients to receive this drug, rather than really uh, 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 excluding this drug at all. I think that what, is expect, what the FDA is expecting is a mitigation plan better than the one we have today mm -hmm. in order to be able to select the patient that will respond to the drug and that will do not have the rapid progressive osteoarthritis. So this is now ongoing in order to, 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 to be able uh, uh, to, to have this uh, uh, optimal mitigation plan. So it's not totally off the table. That's exciting. No, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that if uh, uh, we are able to uh, uh, understand uh, why some patients are developing this rapid progressive OA uh, uh, when they are treated with anti-NGF, uh, then by understanding that we should be able to pick up these patients and then to keep the patient that we will know that they will not have this problem. So what does that mean as a patient when uh, patients are looking at these outcomes being uh, not successful or, or the way that their build is that it's just not going to work? Um, how do you explain that to patients or how do you engage with the lay community about um, uh, kind of what this means for OA research? Does that mean we need to go back and investigate all of these trials again through the lens of looking at these specific groups of patients or, or how do we reconcile that kind of hopelessness feeling when you see these poor outcomes? Yeah, so the, the message I, I, I deliver to my patients about that is that first, the treatment of OA today is not based on drugs only and maybe based on the non-pharmacological approaches. And so I say, uh, uh, okay, there is a problem with a, with a, a, a new drug uh, uh, that maybe will not be on the market or maybe not tomorrow. Uh, um, but still, there are a lot of things to do in order to decrease uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, impact of the disease uh, on your shoulders. Uh, 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 and so to, to, to based on, on, on some uh, uh, possibilities we have, which maybe are not related to, to drugs. Uh, and I think this is very important. So I keep to be uh, positive in my messages uh, because of course, if you just look at the, at the, at the studies and trials and clinical trials in the field in the past 10 years, uh, um, it's always the same. The pilot study is positive. And then when we are in the randomized control trial, the randomized control trial is negative. And so of course, uh, this is uh, really, if you, if you are pessimistic, then you say, okay, uh, we, we will be ne never, uh, able to, 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 to treat patients, which is completely wrong because we are able to treat patients even today. Well, and of course, human patients are complicated and typically, and you've documented this beautifully, the multimorbidity issue, which means that typically osteoarthritis is not the only um, thing that's being treated in a lot of these patients. And I think in the osteoarthritis patient cohort, it's even more prevalent than maybe in other disease spaces. And so it's hard when you're looking at all these different things and who's doing what to who. And I know a lot of people uh, have turned to the four-legged creatures instead of the two-legged creatures to try to look at some of these phenomena in a controlled way. So what do you think are the biggest opportunities or, or do you think there are opportunities in looking at, at more basic science questions to help field this? Or do you think focusing more on, um, on looking more carefully and doing what we can within human clinical populations is a better way to focus or maybe the answer is a little bit of both. Um, what are your perspectives on that? Uh, no, I know, I, I do think that... Um, the future of, of the treatment of OA will come from basic research because we, we know based on what we have learned in other chronic diseases or other uh, non-infectious diseases, 
that the biggest breakthrough, the biggest progresses came from uh, 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 the, the, the basic research. Um, of course, once you have some uh, 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 potential targets coming from the basic research, then you need to uh, uh, have all the clinical uh, uh, environment of uh, the patients. Uh, you have to, 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 to get the clinical experience of the doctors mm -hmm. who are treating the patients. And this is all together that we will be able to find new solutions for the patients. And not only in the OA field, mm -hmm. not only coming from the rheumatology field, but this should come from many other expertises, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, cardiovascular expertise, uh, um, uh, diabetes expertise, um, um, all the expertise that are taking care of patients with chronic disease, age-related chronic disease. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, when you look at the mechanisms of the disease, all these diseases that are related to age have some common background. Mm -hmm. And if you are not speaking with these experts, then you are lacking maybe very, very important uh, information. So that the reason why I really think that the future for OA will come from other expertise. And uh, uh, I think this is so, so important to discuss all together in order at the end to, to have this uh, 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 new knowledge of the disease. And I think that's one of the interesting things about one of the most promising trials that happened recently, the Cantos trial, where we saw an incidental positive finding within the context of OA looking at IL-1 inhibition. And that obviously was a trial that was targeted at more cardiovascular related outcomes. So even though there's um, lots of different components of of that study that we can talk about and, and pros and cons and design and all of that. I think that teaches us that working together with other people from other backgrounds, um, we can learn more because I think Jillian Hawker has done a beautiful branding strategy on talking about how while osteoarthritis might not be killing you, it's helping other things kill you potentially. And so getting yeah. under control is so critical. It's, it's all so interrelated. Yes, that's a very good example. Very, very good example. Uh, we, we, we know that there is an increase in mortality in OA, which is not due directly to the OA process, but which is due to the fact that because of your OA, you will decrease your capacity to walk. So you will increase a sedentary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And by this way, we know that this is a very strong risk factor for cardiovascular events. And there are now many studies showing that. So the patients with OA have an increased risk of dying of not the joints, but due to the cardiovascular system. This is a very good example of that. Mm -hmm. And you also can go in the other way. The patient with pulmonary problem, chest problems, difficulty to, 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 um, uh, to, to walk because of the pulmonary problem. Mm -hmm. And we know that for our joints, it's very important to walk. Physical activity is the main message we, we, we do deliver to our patients every day for the OA patient. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are not able to walk because they have a, a pulmonary problem, uh, 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 they, they, they can have a uh, 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 cardiovascular problem decreasing their capacity to walk. So you see, it's a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's so important to discuss all together. And it's so exciting to see the energy behind that. And it seems like people are really bought in 
from both sides, not only on the whole patient level of looking at multimorbidity, but also with recent energy around the crosstalk between tissues and organ systems, which is something that the uh, uh, Arthritis Foundation and ORSI and other groups and, and the ORS have been such strong supporters of. And there was a beautiful symposium recently um, on this topic. And I think people are starting to understand um, that now that we have the tools and technology and, and models to do some of this work, um, yes. I'm hopeful that that's where we can get some new solutions too. Yes, yes, that's that that that's true. That uh, 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 what is happening in a joint is not, uh, uh, in a way, it's not uh, only wear and tear. Uh, there are really communication between the tissues into the joint. We have the uh, synovial tissue, of course, the membrane around our joints, which could be inflamed in a way. Uh, you have the, the cartilage, of course, which at the end uh, can be uh, uh, degraded. Um, you also have adipose tissue inside the joint. Uh, you, you know that very well. Uh, and, and all these adipose tissue in, in all the body that may have an impact, but uh, focusing on the joint, there is adipose tissue inside the joint that may interplay with the other tissues. You have the bone also that uh, also may, may, may deliver messages to the cartilage or even to the synovial tissue. So all these tissues are communicating all together. Hopefully, usually it, uh, it's in the right way. They are well communicating. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you, and so on. But sometimes there is some stress uh, 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 which co could be uh, uh, um, a mechanical problem or, or which could be a, a metabolic stress or something else uh, which is coming into the joint uh, or coming from the bone to the joint. And then all this communication is altered. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because of this alteration of communication, this will lead to the, to the disease and so to the problem. So this is really very important and, and the support from the uh, uh, Arthritis Foundation on this communication between tissues is so important because uh, I'm sure that uh, a new targets for uh, 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 treating the disease, uh, uh, the, the, the new uh, knowledge in the field of OA will come to the increased knowledge on, of the communication between the tissues. And I think especially you highlight the communication between adipose and, and other tissues. And that's something that I think we both are very interested in and, and are enjoying trying to create new knowledge around that. Um, and I think it's so fascinating because um, you've done a beautiful job highlighting the clinical need of understanding individuals with obesity in the context of osteoarthritis. And one of the big gaps there is that a lot of the epidemiological data doesn't really consider exactly what you're saying, which is what is that tissue? What is it comprised of? And, and we know that the amount of muscle and the amount of fat or adipose tissue um, does matter. And I think fat is, is so fascinating because historically and evolutionarily, it really was something that we needed and we lacked and we were in situations of undernutrition. And so now it's almost like it's it's trying too hard to help us and it's having all these off-target effects that we're, we're now looking at in different basic science models. Um, but I yeah. think that that understanding alone um, will hopefully lead to past osteoarthritis and into other fields on this importance of documenting body composition and um, what these tissues are um, as far as understanding yes. morbidity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very complex tissue. Uh, but uh, you, you know, the, the, at, at the beginning of this story uh, was the fact that uh, epidemiological studies, and some were very strong, um, uh, showing that the patients with obesity uh, increase their risk of having hand osteoarthritis. Yes. This was the, 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 how all this story started. Yeah. Uh, and, and a twofold increase in, in hand away in patients with obesity. And, and uh, of course, this means that there is something coming from the adipose tissue that will impact the joints. Uh, um, and, and what we have learned in, in the last years is that probably um, the impact 
of what is delivered by the adipose tissue in order to have this increase in a way, it's more on the symptoms than on the structure. There, are, there is something also for the structure, an impact on the structure. But uh, it seems that what we have seen was mainly on symptomatic way. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that when there is obesity, uh, uh, the context of obesity and probably what is released by the adipose tissue will increase the symptoms will increase the pain of, mm -hmm. of uh, OA patients. And I must say that um, this will be the challenge for the next years. Yes. The challenge for the next five to 10 years will be to understand pain in OA. It seems very strange that the main symptoms for the patient is pain. Yes. And probably is the what we no, we really do not know today uh, 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 is the, the, the mechanism of pain uh, in a way. And so we are learning a lot on, on, on that field uh, now. There are very strong groups now working in the field of pain. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, maybe 20 years ago, uh, the interactions between the groups working on pain and the groups working on OA mm -hmm. were not really communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and now uh, uh, I think there is strong interactions between the groups working on experimental pain and the groups working on experimental OA. And so I think once again, this is an example of, of why we need a strong communication between different expertise yeah. is that I'm sure that in the next years, we will understand much more on the mechanism of pain. And of course, by this way, a better understanding on the role of adipose tissue in pain in a way. And this, I think, is a challenge for the next years. And I, that I'm so energized by it. And it's so great to see these groups holding um, a lot of the basic science research accountable for incorporating these pain and, and functional and behavioral outcomes. And I think it is so striking. And for those of us that really like complex puzzles, I mean, it's so fascinating to me that you can see a discordance between structure and pain. It does not always go hand in hand. And there's a lot to be learned from, I think, models that show that discrepancy in order to understand patient populations that we read about that are um, also showing disparities between the structural damage and the pain that they experience and how um, those people can help us better understand treatments. In the context of pain, um, there's a lot of really exciting uh, new uh, exercise regimens that have been shown um, with very high efficacy. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, not having direct experience with patients myself, I'm wondering okay. how you with your own patients can um, engage them with these programs such that there's not fear around, um, around uh, antagonizing their pain and um, that they feel more open. Yes, so that's an important question uh, because uh, uh, in consultation, uh, uh, when, when I when I consult my patients, um, since I will not usually give a lot of drugs, mm -hmm. uh, some analgesics, but I will insist on the non-pharmacological treatment of OA, and for that physical activity is critical. Mm -hmm. So you have to spend some time with the patient in order to know what kind of physical activity they, they, they like to do, what they love, what, is, what they would like to, to, to do. Not, I, I, I will not tell them, do that. Mm -hmm. But I will try to understand what they like, what they would like to do, what mm -hmm. they would like to, to perform. So first to understand what kind of activity they would like to do. Second, I will not uh, uh, um, ask them to perform very high level mm -hmm. of physical activity because the risk is that if you say, okay, uh, now um, you will start uh, tomorrow to, to do two hours of physical activity. If it is a, 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 a person who has 
maybe five minutes per day of physical activity, this will not be achievable. And so sh this person will be so disappointed that the person will not continue on mm -hmm. performing this physical activity. So the message is also just start 10 minutes and, 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 and we will see. Just start very, very uh, uh, low, limiting. And you will see that you are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And just do that. And we will see and come back in, in, in three months. And we will discuss again. And, and by this way, step by step, uh, um, they, 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 they see that they are able to do. This is very important. Mm -hmm. So the choice of the physical activity, it's the person who will choose the physical activity they would like to do. And second, we are not speaking on sport, mm -hmm. but speaking on physical activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sport is equal to performance. Mm -hmm. You need to be always over your possibilities. Mm -hmm. This is not what we would like for the patients. What we would like to the patient is physical activity. Mm -hmm. You would like, you like uh, 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 just walking, that's fine. Just walk 10 minutes if it's a person who never walk. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you would like to, 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 to go and swim, fine. Okay, you see that there is no, no limit in, in, the, in the type of, of physical activity. I think that's the exciting message too for people that are intimidated by getting involved in exercise is that the biggest benefits are seen by just what you're describing, these really small um, bouts as you go from sedentary to doing something, right? It doesn't have to be like these extreme Ironman type of things or, or ultra marathons, or I think people feel like they need to get into some kind of running protocol, but it can be so simple. And I think that's the really kind of wonderful thing about activity is that uh, we can incorporate it in, in all kinds of ways where it doesn't have to feel like work. And yeah, the other and, thing and, you know, it, it, it's the same for the, the weight loss. Yes. Uh, uh, it's exactly the same. The, the message is not, Okay, you have a BMI of 35. Uh, so you will come back and see me in six months when you will be at 30. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is not um, uh, possible. Yeah. And so uh, once again, the patient will be so disappointed. And so the person will not come back and see you. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what you do not want. What you want is that you keep on having this communication with your patient and step by step, you know, even if you just lose five kilograms, so it's uh, uh, 10 pounds, uh, um, that's fine. It, it, it's, it's, you will see maybe even with this small decrease in your weight, uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you will see that pain is decreasing. Mm -hmm. um, and so step by step, it's the same. And I think the other thing that goes hand in hand with that weight loss issue is the idea of diet and diet modulation. And I know there's so many interesting ideas around different diets and lots of trends around do, mm. do we eat like dinosaurs? Do, are we afraid of carbohydrates? I mean, the Mediterranean diet is what, at least in the obesity literature, seems to be the most robustly associated with positive health benefits. And I'm sure that your patients are asking you all the time about all these Always. diets they see on the internet or, or through whatever social media. And so yes. how do you feel yes, those yes. types of questions? Yes, yes. The imagination in the field of diet uh, is <laughs> amazing. Uh, <laughs> every year I, I, I learn new diets and, <laughs> and we know why they are behind that uh, people uh, um, trying to, to sell uh, their books and, uh, and, and courses and so on in order to, to have more money. Um, but yes, so the message is uh, there is no miracle uh, diet. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, there could be uh, uh, risks uh, by following uh, uh, exclusion diet, um, yeah. which is a, a danger. Um, so no, the objective is have a safe diet uh, um, and, and have a, 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 a diet that will lead to, 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 to lose some, some uh, 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 pounds. Uh, 
uh, and 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 okay, that's fine if you. But do not consider, uh, do not believe in uh, in 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 uh, magical diets. Well, and we would like to get your French flair on the diet approach because everyone likes to hear that a little cheese and a little bread and wine is okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, that's okay. And getting bringing back to the science, I think with the exclusion diets, like with the carbohydrate exclusion diets, I think that links nicely into another area that yourself and your collaborator, Dr. Salam, wrote a, a beautiful review on about um, the value of the gut bugs and the gut microbiota. And I know that's another area of rich interest in um, patients and in the internet and people oh, yeah. are very sensational around the gut microbiota. And so um, just briefly, there's uh, bugs that live in your gut and those can be changed really readily by what you eat. And um, we now understand through a lot of different um, papers in different areas that that can then affect your uh, uh, metabolic status as well as your inflammatory status within your body. And so um, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about your ideas, Dr. Berenbaum, and, um, and the opportunities yeah. in that space. Yes. Yeah, so it's, uh, we're just uh, at the beginning of the science of, 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 yeah. of macrobiota. So there are many, many books, many uh, uh, um, um, uh, articles uh, in the field, uh, in, in the uh, public press, and in, in, but uh, it's just the beginning of the science. So uh, what I think is quite strong is uh, uh, fibers. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the diet should be enriched in fibers. I think that this could be a message and this has been shown to be anti-inflammatory, and this has been shown to have an impact on, on uh, uh, the symptoms uh, mm -hmm. of the joints. But uh, um, for the other uh, um, um, elements that could modify the macrobiote, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, we, we really, I, it's at, we are not at the stage of delivering a message for the patients. Okay. We are learning. We are really learning on uh, uh, what could have an impact on the uh, uh, microbiota, uh, on the uh, gut flora, um, and and we we are learning. Okay, so we need we need research in this field. In the basic uh, area, it sounds like too in these well controlled um, studies where we can look at cause and effect uh, in the or or at least associations in a really robust way. Yes, exactly. So that's what we need, trials in the field. But I, I see patients now coming with results of their gut microbiota. They have performed an analysis in a laboratory. They uh, have, uh, the, the, the cost was uh, uh, very, very, it was very, very expensive. Uh -huh. uh, specific laboratories, uh, private laboratories that are able uh, to, uh, um, to, to, to provide to the patient an assessment of, uh, of the gut microbiota. And then they come with that and say, okay, what do you think of that? <laughs> and so they, they, they really want to have an answer because they, 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 it was so expensive for them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But unfortunately, my message is, okay, it's really with no help for me. Um, it, I, I cannot tell you, uh, based on that, what you should eat uh, uh, and, and what could be good for your, for your joints and um, whether this difference may have an impact on that. No, not today. And not that's yet. where it's, it's understandable that the patients get frustrated with the science because it is, it is slow in that regard where people are so excited. And with the age of rapid information exchange, people can, can learn about what's going on in different areas, but what it takes for us to be um, really certain and understand and, and be ready to move things up and have it be appropriate. I mean, that takes a certain amount of time, right? So yes. we're, we're working hard. It's not for lack of effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's very, very important to validate uh, mm -hmm. some potential uh, possibilities uh, for the patients, uh, but to not going too fast in delivering messages, mm -hmm. to, uh, saying now you should do that because this is now uh, uh, based on one study. Um, no, it's not like that. It should be validated by many other uh, uh, groups before um, uh, delivering the message. 
Well, I know you mentioned many wonderful topics that you're excited about within osteoarthritis, but what do you think is kind of the biggest opportunity moving forward? My feeling is that the, the biggest opportunity will be to increase our capacity to phenotype the patients. What does it mean? It means that today we, we speak on OA as one disease. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have knee OA or hand OA or hip OA, and this is one, it's OA, okay? Mm -hmm. But we should uh, take advantage of what has been done in cancer. And in cancer now, they are not just looking at uh, breast cancer, uh, 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 um, gut cancer or, or uh, uh, bone cancer or, or any other location, but they are trying to find signatures, mm -hmm. to find markers that are common to different localization, but these markers can be targeted by specific drugs. And so if you have this signature into your tumor, then you will target that tumor with this drug, which is targeting this uh, uh, marker. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and I, I think that we, 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 sh we will go in the next years in that direction also for OA. But we are just at the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And so in order to be able to be at this level uh, of, of uh, uh, efficacy, uh, we first need to have a big cohort of patients with a lot of information coming from clinical data, epidemiological data, uh, uh, their environment of the patient, the genetics of the patient, what we can have as markers coming from the blood, uh, uh, coming from uh, maybe urines, uh, uh, coming from the gut, uh, uh, so all this putting together into a machine and maybe you, the, 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 the people know that uh, the capacity now of the computers based on machine learning capacities, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, all these terms, meaning that they can take all this data and finding new groups of patients. And this group of patients could be targeted according to these uh, uh, signatures or phenotypes. So this is an objective. We are not yet able to do that uh, 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 because it's so complicated to integrate all these layers of knowledge, all these layers genetics, clinical, uh, epidemiologic, uh, and, and so on. But uh, it's going so fast in this field mm -hmm. of, of uh, uh, science that I think we should be able to, to get these new phenotypes based on signatures in, 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 in maybe five years. And, and so by this exactly. way, yes, this could be fantastic. But in order to, to reach this objective, we need to include, and we come back to the beginning of our yes. talk, we need to include all the expertise. Mm -hmm. Because in these different layers of information, maybe we need to have a layer coming from the uh, um, um, cardiovascular field. Yes. Know, or maybe coming from the neurological field uh, mm -hmm. uh, or endocrinological field. And all these expertise will tell us for this specific objective, you should also include this uh, uh, level of information, this mm -hmm. level of data, and include that into your uh, 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 analysis. And if it's only uh, uh, experts in a way, maybe they will not consider to include that. Yes, exactly. So the next big uh, 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 breakthrough in the field will not come from 
us who are experts only. It will come if we are able to discuss with the other to, to design this kind of, of big uh, uh, cohorts uh, and uh, analyzes. But the beauty of that is that it will ultimately lend us to what I think the patients really want and what they're seeking when they're looking through the depths of the internet for solutions is a holistic health understanding to get an idea yeah. of what's going on across the board. And I think that's what people are looking for when they're paying lots of money for gut microbiota sequencing, or there's other continuous glucose monitoring companies and, and the like is that patients want information. And so it's really exciting to hear that you think that we're at a stage where we can bridge that gap and that maybe osteoarthritis and the researchers herein could, could really lead the charge and, and try to get other people on board. So I think it's such a fun space to be in. And thank you so much for, for your ideas and for being such a, um, a provocative thinker and um, uh, making it an exciting time for someone like me to be involved in this area. Thank you so much, Kessie.